very excited to be here. Uh, so um, my name is Forrest Lee. I am the Senior Director of Creative Operations at a company called Skyward in Boston. Uh, I flew in here Wednesday morning, so I'm more or less fully recovered from that life. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his, uh, in case you need to refer to me in the third person. And uh, for just about 20 years, uh, I've been a writer and storyteller working on some of the biggest brands in the world. Um, I started my career at Hasbro. Uh, Amanda and I worked together there. Uh, I worked on, like from day one, I worked on Transformers and Pokemon, then I took on Star Wars. Uh, and over the course of about 15 years there, I touched every single brand, almost every single brand in the company. Um, then I took what I learned there to the world of content marketing. In my current role at Skyward, I help our clients, which are companies like Samsung, Avid, IBM, I help them learn how storytelling uh, can turn them just from like a recognizable name into a meaningful brand that has a long-lasting personal relationship with their audience. They can stop being just a brand that people recognize and become legendary in the minds of their audience. Um, oh, and my computer was safe. <laughs> the inevitable technical difficulty. Good. All right, cool. Let's jump ahead and slides too. Uh, quick content warning, I do use some examples from video games. I got really excited to come talk to a video game company. So there are some spoilers for older games. Uh, like I think the newest game I use an example from is The Last of Us, as well as some depiction of violence in here. So I hope that's okay with everyone. You're all, I assume, gamers, so you've probably seen this stuff. Um, so, storytelling. Stories are how we as humans assign meaning to otherwise meaningless objects. As an example, who can tell me who this is? Oh, yeah, see, that was a trick question. <laughs> it was clearly a trick question because I knew everyone would say that. This is admittedly a very nice toy, but it's just a collection of plastic and metal and rubber. It's only once we tell a story about him that he becomes Optimus Prime, leader of the Autobots, and champion of freedom for all sentient beings. Um, the application of story makes him worth more than the cost of the materials and the labor that it, that it takes to produce him. So when I started at Hasbro, actually no, I'm sorry, when I was a kid, they used to put uh, little character stories in the back of all the Transformers packages. Um, and it was those stories of what I saw in the cartoon and read in the comics that helped me build relationships with the characters. And, and build allegiances with the characters. And that's how I made decisions about which toys I wanted to purchase. But when I started at Hasbro, they didn't do those character bios anymore. The reason that they gave me was that kids don't read, which I think if that's true, then J.K. Rowling owes us all a bunch of money. Um, and at the same time, Transformer sales were actually really weak. Um, there were a bunch of new characters that didn't recognize because there was no way for them to be introduced to them that just sat on the shelves. And even recognizable characters like Optimus Prime didn't sell super well because if I already own an Optimus Prime, why do I need another one in my collection? So I lobbied for a long time to get character bios put back on packages because I felt like they were really important. Uh, and so eventually the brand manager said, okay, there's a line of Walmart exclusives, go ahead and put some character bios on there. And I did, and that line of Walmart exclusives, completely unknown characters, new characters that I named, sold out in a weekend. It was unheard of. And online, people were raving like they were very excited about the return of character bios. They felt like they read the story on the package, and then they had to buy the toy. They couldn't not buy it because it had a name and had a story behind it. So they let me put character bios on all of the packages. And over the course of the next year, sales of Transformers toys went up by about 10%. Now, I don't have like direct evidence that my stories were why sales went up, but I feel very strongly that they were a strong contributor. Um, so, and, and to be clear, these were like little threes and stories. They weren't like really deep stories, but they mattered to people. They helped people build an emotional connection with the character. They seized the imagination, uh, and they compelled action in the audience. Um, this is why storytelling is so important in marketing. It helps create a powerful emotional association with a product or a service or a game, and it contributes to a body of lore. 
that activates what I'm going to call myth in the minds of your audience. Now, this is incredibly powerful marketing anything, but when what you sell is stories like it is here at Wuga, it's super, super important that the story that you're telling in your games flows through and out into your marketing, that there's a continuum through all of this. So I wanna, what I'm going to talk about today is the power of storytelling and how you can use it to build a body of lore around a product and create a myth in the mind of your audience. Um, Story-driven lore is what turns a brand that people recognize into something that they love, what I'm going to call a myth. So in order to get there, we want to understand first how lore and myth is created. Second, we're going to talk about the structure of what I'm calling purpose-told story. And when I say purpose-told story, uh, that is a term coined by Robert McKee. And it means that it is a story that the teller tells because they have an objective in the telling of it. They want to inspire an action from their audience. Uh, and then third, we're going to talk about how you can take that single, well-built, purpose-told story and build lore around it to create myth in the mind of your audience. So before we get into that, I want to demonstrate the power of myth. By show of hands, who here would describe themselves as a fan of Star Wars? Like you have a strong emotional connection to the brand. Raise your hands if you're a fan of Star Wars. <laughs> Very few Star Wars fans here. Okay. It's close. Keep your hands up. <laughs> Keep very simple people. <laughs> Keep your hands up. <laughs> and think very carefully about this next piece. There are 11 movies in the franchise. If you are a fan of 50% or more of the movies, if you love 50% of their movies, keep your hands up. If not, lower. Okay, this is actually surprising. Because the majority of people who had their hands, you put your hands down. Thank you. <laughs> keep them up for the whole presentation. I'll talk for 45 minutes. I want to see how strong you are. Um, most of the time, I've taken this poll a few times, and most of the time, uh, and I have like really close friends who are serious cosplayers, like people who are super into Star Wars, but most of the time, when I talk to people, when I take this poll, the majority of people are not fans of 50% or more of the movies. So how is that a thing? How is it possible that something can be the most valuable brand in the world but the people who describe themselves as the biggest fans don't like most of what it is. That's weird. How is Star Wars still a thing? Well, so this is how myth works. This is why myth is so powerful. Because for people who describe themselves as fans, like myself and like three people in this room, <laughs> big group of nerds and no one likes Star Wars. It's very weird. I thought it <laughs> No, I actually cling on to <laughs> so for fans, the sound of a lightsaber igniting. No, at least that works. Hello? No? Mm -hmm. All right. The sound of a lightsaber igniting, the sound of Darth Vader breathing, the sound of John Williams' score. The first you know, there it is. <laughs> Thank you. You play that sound for me, and I get, like, teary-eyed. Yeah. It's that powerful, right? So that's the power of myth. It's not about a collection of stories like the movies. It's about these, these signaling objects that connect to emotion in your mind and activate re or reactivate the way you felt the first time you had your mind kind of cracked open by this killer story. Story implants meaning in the mind of the audience. That first story implants meaning. But lore, the sound of the lights are igniting or Luke Skywalker's bio or something like that, locks that meaning in place and makes it re-accessible to later activation. Uh, and this is an understandable and repeatable process. There's a measure of luck involved. Obviously, George Lucas and the people who make Star Wars are really lucky, but it, if you apply skill and thought and consistent application of lore and expand the universe thoughtfully, you can repeat this process. So that process is what I'm going to explore through the rest of this talk. So how is myth created in the modern world? We don't do it the way we used to. Uh, and I want to define my terms a little bit, because I've used the term lore and myth kind of interchangeably so far. Um, but what I mean when I say lore is 
not a collection of stories, as I said. It's really the recognizable artifacts of a storified universe. So, like I said, it's the sound of lightsaber igniting, or the way deflector shields work, or the shape of the Millennium Falcon, uh, or the, what the Kessel Run is. These are lore, right? Um, myth refers to a fungible psychological whole formed from those lore artifacts in the minds of the audience. Um, myth is what allows us to remain in love with a thing, even if we don't care for most of its individual parts. We absorb lore. We unconsciously select the pieces of it we choose to believe are true, and then we disregard the rest as irrelevant. Uh, the movie Star Wars movie is actually a really good example of that. So we used to create myth in a certain way, because as I've said, stories have humans ascribe meaning to objects that are otherwise mysterious. The sun in the ancient world. I mean, we look up at the sun, and we understand that it's powerful and important, but we don't understand what it is. And so we start telling stories about it. I am looking at the sun, and I know from the way that it warms my body that it gives me life, um, that, it, that it helps the plants grow. But I also can feel, or I know, that it dries up the water, that it can kill plants, that it burns my skin. Um, it's a thing of incredible beauty that if I stare at it, it blinds me. And so here I am looking at the sun. That's me from a long time ago. Uh, and I tell a story about it. Uh, a lot of people are probably telling stories about it. My story is really awesome. It has drama, sacrifice, and a protagonist that my audience, the people in my village, can really get behind. And because they love my story, because it is meaningful to them, and it is consistent with their needs, they choose to believe that it is the truth. And so to keep them engaged, I continue to add to the story. I add detail to it. I add bits of lore until it becomes locked in place in their minds. And so that even if, as I add more and more detail, they, I add something they don't like, they just disregard it because it's not meaningful to them. So this is not how myth is created. Obviously, we have better methods for explaining natural phenomenon. Uh, but our need for meaning is not dissimilar because we live in a world that is surrounded, we're surrounded by disordered chaos. And story is how we pull meaning out of that chaos. There's a lot of lag in my clicking. That's not my time. Um, the way, the mechanisms by which we create myth these days are politics and art. So politicians always communicate through story. And the very, the most successful ones tell stories in a way that seeds myth into the minds of their audience. And they do this consciously or not because they want to uh, secure their place in the minds of their audience as either supermen or saviors. They consolidate power through myth making. And they can do this uh, through either a benign motivation or extremely malignant motivation. They can create myth that helps create these sweeping cultural movements that change lives for the better for millions of people, or it can breed conspiracy theory and violence. This picture of Stalin is insane. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about art and how art can create myth, or how storytelling can create myth. It is equally powerful as storytelling. And just as with politics, not all art involves storytelling. It's not a necessary quality of art. So we're just talking about art forms that involve storytelling, which I'm including marketing in. Skip ahead a little bit. There. Oh my god. Clickers. So, a little spoiler by skipping actually in the next slide, but this brings me to something that I think is really interesting about the link between marketing, storytelling and marketing, and storytelling and game design. Because these are two forms of storytelling that are different from any other form of storytelling. This is kind of a branch from my hat as I was working on this talk to speak with you all. I was thinking about marketing storytelling and how storytelling and marketing must compel action. It has to go beyond regular story form. And gaming is the only other form of storytelling that does this. Um, games and marketing are both what I've said already is called a purposeful story. So I'm sure a lot of people in the room are familiar with this quote. Uh, Sid Meier's right here. A game is a series of meaningful choices, or at least a story-driven game is. 
But since code is actually missing a couple things that I think are really important when we're talking about stories that motivate actions, purposeful stories. See, most story forms, novels, film, television, it's enough to relate what happened, why it mattered, and how the protagonist was changed by it. But the power of the purpose-told story in marketing and in games lies in these two things. First, the purpose-told story must compel action from its audience. There it is. Second, the choice to take action must feel meaningful. And what's important about this is that it must feel like a meaningful choice, even if it's not actually a choice. If the audience or player doesn't get a choice, it still has to feel like they've made a meaningful decision. See, marketing and game designs are unique for related forms of storytelling. Uh, and they're unlike anything else. Each of them places the audience in a situation in which they feel driven to take an action, and in which that action must feel voluntary and meaningful. If either of those is missing, the story feels unsatisfying at best. But the best games and the best marketing do this, they compel action and make it feel meaningful through creating a continually narrowing decision space. It places the audience on an inevitable course towards the action you want as storytellers you need, want or need them to take, while still making the audience feel as if they are driving the action through choice. So this is a scene from The Last of Us, which I hope many of you have played. But this is a really excellent example of this. Woo, choppy. I apologize for that. I was told that Uga had the best Wi-Fi. <laughs> All right, it's immaterial. <laughs> By the time you reach this scene, this fight in the hospital, uh, you as the player, along with Joel, are left no other emotionally sensible choice but to go and rescue Ellie. Spoiler alert, sorry, this game's like 10 years old. Um, so while the game itself leaves you no option to walk away, the choice that Joel, both Joel, Joel makes and the player makes at the same time feels really satisfying and organic. It feels like you are making an emotional move, even though the game itself is just compelling you forward. So while I'm mostly talking about marketing here, how to construct marketing stories, I'm using these examples from games because they're a really similar form of storytelling, and they're a really good example of how the purposeful story compels an action and makes it feel meaningful. Hopefully not all the videos are like this, because some of them have audio. So, I'm sure that most of the writers in the room, at least, are familiar with Joseph Campbell's monument. This is kind of the archetypal structure for most traditional story forms. Um, it shows us how a protagonist and a good, well-constructed story moves from equilibrium through discomfort, risk, transformation, and eventually a return to equilibrium. The structure of the purposeful story is distinct from this because it concerns itself in many ways, or almost primarily, with the emotional and intellectual experience of the audience in connection with the protagonist, not just the protagonist's journey, but the audience's journey as well. So to talk about purpose-told stories, we need to talk about the experience of the audience and the protagonist as they move through the story structure. And for that, I'm gonna to turn to and lean very heavily on a guy named Robert McKee, who I've mentioned a couple times already. So, for those who don't know him, Robert McKee has been, since 1983, teaching a seminar called Story, mostly for screenwriters. Uh, it was made popular by the movie, or popular by the movie Adaptation, uh, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it. But even before then, going to a story seminar was kind of a bucket list thing for a lot of writers. And more recently, uh, McKee teamed up with the founder of my company to write a book called Storynomics and tour a seminar around this, which is about the purposeful story and how it's a powerful tool in the marketers, the marketing storyteller's toolbox. Now, Storynomics is an eight-hour seminar, so I'm not going to get into his model in detail, but we do need to talk about it a little bit. So I'm going to give you a super abridged version, but if you're interested in this, um, I highly recommend picking up these books. They're very, very interesting, especially as a storyteller. So where McKee starts is this. There are two human experiences, pleasure and pain. Obviously there are nuances and details, but every human experience comes down to these two things. And in order to compel, compel action from your audience, your story must activate one of these experiences for them. Um, in fact, resolution of pain will be very familiar to the marketers in this room. 
it's a very common marketing tactic. The, the basic level is we show how the audience is in pain or suffering without our product or service, and then we show how the product or service alleviates or mitigates that pain, ta-da, alleviate resolution of pain. This is where halfway decent marketing kind of starts. But if it's all you're doing, then you're just doing the bare minimum. Uh, marketing is like art, and as I've already mentioned, great art creates meaning, great storytelling creates meaning. It engenders ambition. It inspires delight. It, it, it excites your senses. It can drive you weeping into the arms of your lovers or your friends. Uh, good marketing, like a good game or a nice painting, makes you feel better. But great marketing, like a great story or a great game, makes you feel something you've never felt before. Here's an example. Hopefully this works. So <clears throat> I've said this phrase a bunch of them, I keep saying it because it's important, but great marketing compels action. But the action it compels is not necessarily a purchase. Marketing like this, the purpose of it is not to drive people towards pur purchase, though it can do that. What it does is it creates emotional affinity between the audience and the brand. It's part of a long game that involves the creation of lore around the brand, the fertile ground in which myth can take root. Marketing is not sales. It's not marketing's job to turn people into one-time purchasers. Marketing's job, when it's done really, really well, is to turn people into fans, because fans are loyal. Fans will buy your product, or buy your game, or go see your movie every time, because they love the story that you're telling. They love the myth that you're creating, even if they don't actually like a lot of what you do, like Star Wars. So, 
the key has a structure for a purpose told story. Here it is. It's very simple, obviously. Um, this is his model for a single self-contained purpose told story. That means a single sort of unit of storytelling, whether it's a chapter in a game or an issue of a comic book or a commercial or a podcast, whatever. This is a self-contained story, and using this model, you can create a purpose told story that will serve as the foundation for your myth. Um, it, is, it is using stories like this as a foundation that can help you turn your brand or your product into a cultural touchstone. Now, we don't have time to get into this, as I've said, so I'm gonna hit the highlights and touch on the things that are especially important for the next section where I'm gonna talk about how to build lore and create a myth. So first, I'm sort of counterintuitively here on the right, your right, uh, are the three targets you must have to craft a story that compels action. First, you have to identify your audience. And this is more than just demographics. You need to build a detailed theory of who your audience are as people, what we call a persona in marketing. Next, you need to understand their need. You have to understand the need that you're going to ask the audience to take action to resolve. This is the resolution of pain that I was talking about. And this is what you're gonna to leverage to motivate your audience to take action. And what I thought was neat uh, when I was thinking about this in the context of games is that video games are actually super good at this because the need that, that your audience has, sometimes, depending on the story you're telling and who the audience is and the action you wanna compel, sometimes the story itself creates the need that you're going to ask your audience to take action to resolve. The example I thought of uh, is maybe a little bit of a deep cut for younger people, but for me, I don't know if I've ever wanted revenge on someone as much as I wanted to kill Sephiroth for killing Eris. That was a need that that video game created in me that I still feel. So next, you need to decide what action you're going to ask the audience to take to resolve their need. Now during this stage of stories development, marketing stories development especially, it's super important that the marketing team or the product team, doesn't matter what you're working on, remain in communication and have a common understanding of these three elements. If there is disconnect, then one side or the other won't work for the audience. So it's super important that you guys or any teams collaborate on this section. Uh, this is even more important if what you're selling is story, and especially if you're going to engage in a long campaign, marketing campaign, or attempt to build lore around your brand. The next stage is on the left, and is the most important stage if you want to engage in that long game of building a myth around your brand. The first thing you need to decide on are the bones of your story, society, place, and time. This is the basic setting of your story. Uh, the spatial, cultural, and temporal facts of your universe. Like, um, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, there was a rebellion against an evil empire, or today, in a film studio, we ask some actors what it means to do something like a girl. Next is protagonist. The protagonist is a little less obvious, only because it's not necessarily uh, a person or an animal. It can be a brand or a product. It can be anything. The one non-negotiable component or, or truth about your protagonist is they must be empathetic. Uh, because as you will see, the creation of an empathetic protagonist is uh, what your story hinges on. Your audience must be able to empathize with your protagonist. The empathetic protagonist is critical to the success, success of a purposeful story and to the successful establishment of lore. Whether you're crafting this story for marketing purposes, for a game, or for some other reason, if you hope to inspire action from your audience, you must have an empathetic protagonist because of what he calls the mirror experience. Now, the purpose told story, or any good story really, creates two experiences in the mind of the audience. One is rational and one is emotional. The rational experience hinges on the same set of questions and concerns that we all experience as we move through our daily lives, but it really comes down to curiosity. It's the same question that motivates us through any story, which is, I wonder what's gonna happen next. The emotional experience is a little bit more complex, and it's why an empathetic protagonist is so critical. Your audience doesn't need to like your protagonist, but they absolutely must empathize. And there are three stages to the emotional experience. The first is identification. They see something in the protagonist with which they can identify. 
And so they say to themselves, this character is like me, therefore I want them to achieve their goals. The next phase is the subconscious switch, where now the, the audience has identified with the protagonist, they put themselves in the protagonist's shoes, the story becomes their story. And the third is the reenactment phase. This is the placement of themselves into the story, and it is what compels the audience to act. And it lends the act that they take significant symbolic weight. In games, this is where the illusion of meaningful choice comes in. If the story has been told well to the point that the audience must take action, then that decision or action feels personal and important. Even if the audience makes no actual choice, like in that scene from The Last of Us that I showed, they are, they are compelled by the emotional momentum of the story, and they feel the shifting weight of a heavy decision within their heart. So I'm going to show this to you again, hopefully. So you can see the moment at which Joel makes the decision to kill this soldier right as he sees Ellie's backpack. And what's interesting is that by this phase of the story, we have empathized or identified with Joel so powerfully that we, the player, make that same decision at that same instant. And even though the game, as I've said, doesn't leave us an out, we make that choice and it feels meaningful. And it feels as if we have actually chosen to take action. We're compelled by the emotional momentum of the story. Now, in a marketing story, the reenactment impulse is a little bit more benign than suddenly torturing and killing a soldier. It's usually about making a purchase or changing, shifting attitude. But you can see that this ability to cause an emotional shift in someone is a phenomenally powerful tool in your toolbox as storytellers. Next is core value. And what we mean when we say core value is not immediately apparent, but what it refers to is the essential tension between the pleasure and pain uh, experiences, positive and negative. It's a tension between these two dynamic opposites that creates the energy that moves the story forward. And it's usually phrased in terms of, as I said, dynamic opposites, like peace versus war, uh, order versus chaos. Um, I actually want to quiz you all a little bit. In the always video that I showed, uh, who wants to take a guess at what the core value of that story would be? If I've explained it. You had a thought. It was about the actual ending of Last of Us, which is a little bit of a higher level. Yes. But individual versus the, the one, the needs of the one versus the needs of the many. It's good Star Trek reference, too. <laughs> I haven't, I actually didn't examine The Last of Us that deeply, I just looked at that one climactic moment, but you're probably right. In the Always uh, video, um, my take on it was that it is the balance between self-esteem and self-doubt uh, that strikes um, young women at this particular point in their lives. But self, the, the dynamic power between self-esteem and self-doubt is incredibly powerful, and it's something that we all experience, right? Watching that video, I feel like I certainly do, and I'm sure a lot of people in this room feel that up and down movement between positive and negative throughout that story. So then finally we have the actual course and structure of the story. I'm gonna race through this because it's very complicated, but you can break it down pretty simply. Uh, and it does mirror the monomyth a little bit. So at the beginning, you have your protagonist and the universe as described by the core value in balance. It's an equilibrium, which is then struck by the inciting incident, which knocks the whole universe described by the core value out of balance. It's that lack of equilibrium that compels our protagonist to take action to restore the equilibrium. But throughout the course of the story, they are opposed by forces that continue to subvert what their expected outcome of the actions they take are, until finally they reach a crisis moment where they are forced into a dilemma and must choose either between irreconcilable goods or the lesser of two evils. And as a result of that choice, they either succeed and achieve their object of desire and the universe is restored to equilibrium, or they fail and are destroyed. Either way, at this moment, another very important thing happens in the mind of the audience. Uh, who, remember, is sharing the emotional and intellectual experience of the protagonist. So I want you to consider for a moment that deep rush of satisfaction that strikes you at the climax of a well-told story. The aha moment, the insight, surprise, and understanding when the sense and meaning of an entire story 
is suddenly laid bare in retrospect. Here's another example. Is it In the end, what separates a man from a slave? Money, power, no. A man chooses. A slave obeys. You think you have memories? A father. moments like that moment from Bioshock in our mind. Uh, and it is where the storytelling marketer places their call to action and asks the audience to make a purchase or fill out a form or change their attitude. Um, but it's also this moment, supported by all that came before and reinforced by the lore that you're going to build upon the foundation of this kind of a story that allows us to transform that single story into a myth. So now you have Robert McKee's structure for a purposeful story. It's one that engages the emotions of the audience, motivates them to take action, and it locks that key moment into their memory and their mind. But how do you turn that single story into a myth? How do we build on that foundation to create something that is immortal in the minds of your audience? So here's where we're going to leave Robert McKee come behind and talk a little bit more theoretically about what I've done for most of my career, which is using good stories or great stories if I flatter myself, I guess, um, to turn customers into fans. People are going to come back again and again. Um, now, you can use the approach I'm going to talk about here to build a really strong brand for just about anything, but not every product or service needs to or can be turned into a myth the way I'm describing them. Uh, doing it requires careful thought, it requires the right product, and it requires consistent activation of your lore in a very thoughtful way. Um, and also, as I said, it requires a little bit of luck as well, kind of a lot of luck. So I want to return for a moment to this guy here, Optimus Prime. So like I said, he's just a collection of plastic and rubber and metal until we give him a story. And that's true of almost anything. Um, T-shirts, beer, soda, bleach. Uh, these are useful functional objects, but once you apply story to them, they become meaningful. A t-shirt or an article of clothing can become an object of love. Beer becomes the default mechanism by which a lot of us create or deepen friendships. Soda can become an emblem of your independence of thought. And even bleach makes you, as you use it, like it makes you feel cleaner. It makes you feel like less of a sinful person. Uh, so once you've told that single great story that triggered that open mind moment, your second step is to begin adding lore to your universe. 
And as I noted at the beginning, it's the cumulative effect of that lore that creates an engine. And there are four stages. It's what we call a marketing, a marketing campaign. Um, and it comes down to these steps, carefully considered and repeated over time. First, the first two I already covered. You have to identify and under, understand your audience, and you have to have a nuanced understanding of your audience. And any well-built story that compels action and engages empathy can serve as the foundation of lore, which will help you build a myth. So the next part is expanding your universe. You do this by adding either additional purpose-told stories or other lore elements. <coughs> um, in a marketing campaign, this can be uh, social posts, it can be additional smaller spin-off stories. Um, the way my company, Skyward, does it is we will create a linked chain of stories that address different parts of a, a client's customer's need. Um, in games, I think it probably is DLC or additional chapters or other updates. Um, but for a really exceptional example of how you add lore to reinforce that open mind moment and build that myth, I want to return to Star Wars again. Because as we talked about, or as I mentioned, like people here consistently like the movies, which is great, but as we talked about, a lot of people don't. So how is it still a thing? Well, the answer is, the movies were never it. They were never everything about Star Wars. This is a picture of a theater in 1977 during the opening of the first movie when people stacked up by their hundreds to go see this movie. It was a huge hit. And when people left the theater, their minds were cracked wide open and they were begging for more. They wanted to fill the, the hole in their mind that Star Wars had left, that emotional readiness to receive the lore. And Star Wars was totally delivered just in 1977. Before the movie came out, there were already comics and novels. Then there were toys. And by 1981, there was even like a radio drama version of the movie, which, if you haven't heard it, is amazing. Uh, Mark Hamill's in it, and you can like hear how amped on cocaine he is. <laughs> so it was the movie as a founding story that created that <coughs> moment. And, but it was these elements, all this other stuff, that locked that, that moment in place and started creating Star Wars myth. Now, how much lore you can pile on is really related to the, the tolerance of your audience. Not everything is going to be like Star Wars. Not everything is going to make people so ready to just receive everything that they can take. Um, so it's super important to understand the impact that the lore you are creating or the marketing campaign elements you are creating uh, are having. Um, measurement, it's really like in marketing we're, we're asked for measurement all the time. Um, you have to understand how your expanding universe is affecting your audience and how they are reacting to it. Are they reacting positively to it? Are they taking steps to stay in touch with your lore uh, in a marketing campaign? Are they moving closer to a converting action, a sale or whatever? Uh, and also, as your universe expands, your audience will change. People's needs change over time, and their exposure to your universe will have a tendency to shift their attitude. And so as part of understanding your impact, you return to the beginning of this cycle of steps. You have to continually update your understanding of the audience and respond to their shifting needs. But as you add more <coughs> elements, it's also really important that you don't become like an, a slave to every petty demand from your audience. You must remain true to the core value of your founding story, or your lore will collapse under the weight of its own inconsistencies. And while I was researching this, I found this quote, which I think is super relevant. People don't want to be satisfied. They don't want to have all of their questions answered or all of their needs fulfilled. They want to want things. They want to have a need or a desire satisfied only so they can clear space in their, in their selves for the next need or desire. So as you answer questions and as you fill needs, make sure that you're doing so in a way through your lore that plants in the seed of the next question or the next desire. Remember that curiosity is what drives people through a story. And so always leap open the question, I wonder what's going to happen next. I wonder what's just over that next hill. Finally, these are the three pillars that underpin every modern myth and that you should be considering even as you create that initial purpose told story. These are the mechanisms by which the lore you are going to build uh, 
will seize upon the memories implanted in your audience's mind during that open mind moment. Uh, you can use purpose, tone, and character to lock an idea in place and help them remain open to the expansion of your universe so that you can reaccess that memory and those feelings at any time. Now, you can build a brand, a really strong brand, on any single one of these. But for a myth to take on life in the mind, all three have to be active. So purpose is tied back to the core value of your story. It's possible that your core value can shift a little bit, but it really needs to maintain consistency throughout the life of your brand. Um, the Always video I played earlier is a really excellent example of the leveraging of the purpose pillar in the building of a brand. Uh, as you watch the video and experience that story, you feel yourself fall out of equilibrium because we're laughing at the beginning of the video, and then towards the end, in the middle of the end, you get kind of somber as you realize like the, the problem that the, the video is revealing. Um, and while the equilibrium is restored by the end of that video, you leave it with a lingering sense of injustice. And always took advantage of that. They added campaign elements, or what I'm calling lore in the purposes of this, this discussion, uh, in print, digital videos, online, on social, that continually confronted their audience with this question, what does it mean to do something like a girl? And the results for them were absolutely extraordinary. So here's some stats from their website, but they also had 90 million views on YouTube in the first month. Um, they had overwhelming positive brand sentiment. The United Nations, issued a declaration recognizing the importance of this marketing campaign. And they ran a survey that showed that 70% of women and 60% of men reported a newly positive association with a phrase like a girl. <clears throat> now, is always going to turn into a myth in the minds of their audience? Probably not. They don't need to. But I think this is a very, very powerful example of how purpose can help build a brand. It can help establish it in the minds of its consumers or audience. Next is tone. Tone is the essential character and voice of your brand and your story. A great example of this, in 2010, uh, the brand Old Spice was, like we were talking about this yesterday, was lagging behind. Um, Axe was inexplicably dominant in this space. Uh, but they were also losing market share to brands like Dove, which were uh, traditionally associated with women. Old Spice was viewed as a brand for old men. And so a lot of younger men were just, why would I want to wear my grandpa's yoga? Until they launched this commercial. <laughs> oh, sound, come on. Kill me. Hello, me. Look at your back. Now back to me. Now back to me. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he stopped using ladies' scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat. The man, your man, could smell it. What's in your head? Back at me. I am. It's a voice note. Two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now dying. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. <laughs> Uh, and it launched the foundation on which Old Spice began a campaign that continues to this day, uh, where they added additional humorous elements uh, following this tone and featuring that guy, and updates to their packaging, which I love. I don't know if you guys can read it. Yeah, some of these are great. So, <laughs> to this day, nearly a decade after that ad first aired, that ad still racks up views, by the way, uh, partially because the guy in it was also in the It movies. Um, but they continue to add stories in the same vein. Uh, they, they're building up a body of lore uh, that people continue to return to, and they keep Old Spice through this tone-based brand securely in the top slot in this market space. Now, as with always, it's unlikely that Old Spice is going to become quite mythical the way that Star Wars does, but I think they're closer because they've clearly activated in a very powerful way two of the pillars of myth. One, tone, obviously, and secondly, character, with the strength of the Old Spice guy, which is his actual name. <laughs> um, and then you can sort of see in the deep background some purpose there uh, of, of activating confidence and humor in their, in their audience. Now for character, uh, well, I have a few examples, but 
if purpose grows out of the core value of your story and tone is essential in its telling, then character obviously ties back to your empathetic protagonist and is why the empathetic protagonist is so, so critical. Um, it is very hard for a lot of brands to activate this pillar, but it's super, super important. It's the most powerful pillar in the creation of myth. And obviously, entertainment brands like Star Wars and Transformers, but also a lot of video games, are really good at using character as a foundation for myth. Um, but there are also some consumer brands that do this super well. Um, for instance, here is an ad from one of Coca-Cola's typical campaigns, or biggest campaign. Uh, again, the sound. consistency of their tone and the clarity of their purpose, which is to create moments of happiness, and the strength of their character, the strength and consistency of their character, they have established an unassailable place in global culture. Coke is the second most recognizable word in the world after okay, <laughs> which is bonker. And as further evidence of this, which I think is really interesting, uh, their misunderstanding of the myth they had activated in the minds of their devotees in 1985 led to 74 days of absolute hell for their executive team and their marketing team because of this <laughs> new Coke. New Coke, uh, when they tested it, people actually liked it more than the original formula. They did for focus groups, people loved it. But when it launched, it was so reviled that 1,500 people a day, which in 1985 is big numbers, called it their headquarters to complain. They had a psychologist listen to some of these calls, and he said that some of the people calling were reacting to this change in formula the way they would react to the death of a family member. <laughs> 74 days this was on the market, which is a tiny fraction in the history of a company that's been selling the same soda more or less unchanged for one ingredient that they don't put in anymore. Uh, for 127 years, they've been selling this soda, and the 74 days looms large in our cultural memory because it, too, is a part of Coca-Cola's myth. So that's pretty much it. It's this simple. You have to understand your audience, really understand them. You have to respond to their needs with a great story that engages their mind, engenders emotion, and activates their empathy and compels them to action. You have to deepen their emotional involvement with your story through the addition of further stories or other lore. You have to respond to a changing world and an evolving audience by further expanding your universe, but do so carefully. Do it in a way that remains consistent with your purpose, tone, and character. And if you can do these things, and if, you, if your storytelling strikes the right chord, then you really can create something extraordinary, something that's more than just a great game or a cool toy or a can of soda. You can create something that is truly meaningful to people, that enriches their lives, that becomes part of the tale that they tell about themselves. I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. I went 
way over time, but if anyone has questions, I am happy to try and answer them. Cool, I guess I was like very thorough. <laughs> Um, Alyssa, what's next? <laughs> lunch. lunch, all right. Yeah, we're lunch. Yeah. 